I often wonder about the nature of reality, about our relationship to the creative force that forged the particles of our stars and intertwined them with the molecules of our bodies. Who are we? And where are we actually sitting within the architecture of our universe? Are we alone? Or is the answer simply stranger than we can think? My name is Jeremy Corbell. I seek to weaponize your curiosity. And if you're ready to suspend your own prejudice, welcome to the world of extraordinary beliefs. My name's Chad Underwood. My call sign is Nuts. I was a lieutenant at the time on USS Nimitz. I filmed the Tic Tac video with the VFA 41 Black Aces, serving under my commanding officer, Dave Sex Fravor. Declassified videos, authentic Department of Defense footage. Oh, oh my God. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. I wanted to bring every single mode and zoom that the FLIR is capable of back to the carrier so we could analyze this thing because I'm not going to be able to solve this problem in real time. It was offensively jamming us just outside international waters in peacetime operations. It's an act of war and we're going to go out there and make you pay for that. Good to talk with you. So you are now a uh, commander Chad Underwood, not anymore Lieutenant uh, Chad Underwood. Uh, we're talking about the Tic Tac UFO case and I'm just uh, you know, thanks for being here. And can you just introduce yourself? At the time of the um, Nimitz encounter, I was a lieutenant um, back in 2004. And, and since I've uh, uh, served almost 21 years um, to the day uh, as, and got promoted to uh, lieutenant commander and then commander um, a few months ago. And, but at the time of the Nimitz encounter, I was a lieutenant. And this is the first video interview that, that you're doing. That's correct. Okay. So you were involved in the most famous modern day UFO case of all time, the Tic Tac UFO case. You, you are the man that filmed the Tic Tac UFO, the footage that everybody knows around the world. The story has been on 60 Minutes with Commander Fravor, with Alex Dietrich, but you are the man that filmed the Tic Tac UFO. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? Like, how does that feel? More weird than and, and interesting than than usual. I I would never would have suspected seventeen almost seventeen years ago that this would be a um, a thing in the media. It's weird. It's interesting, but it happened, and so you got to acknowledge it. My friends and family just kind of crack up every time. Um, you know, there's a a link on you know, Fox, you know, on whatever news outlet is out there. I'm just like, really? Again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's got to be kind of surreal, you know? It, it's very surreal. Um, that That's for sure. And um, uh, I never thought in a million years that the the, the term Tic Tac would be um, still in the zeitgeist of, of where we are. <laughs> okay, well, that's, we got to talk about that. So, there's a funny story that you shared with me that I'd love people to hear is how did you come up? You're, you're the man that named the Tic Tac UFO. How did you come up with the name Tic Tac UFO? Can you tell us how you came up with that term? Of course. Um, anyone who knows me, uh, friends, family, et cetera, yourself, um, knows that my sense of humor is very um, rooted in these uh, 80s and 90s. I love like the slapstick comedy of airplane naked gun top secret fletch caddyshack etc that that kind of physical slapsticky humor and so when we went out there and we we had this encounter dave fravor had already uh debriefed his flight and so everyone on the on the carrier at least in the in the aviation wing uh knew about this by the time I landed and I went to the uh, intelligence center. And so I brought my tapes back and they were like, Hey, did you see a, a, a UFO too? And I'm like, actually I got it up here on video. 
they were like, you know, their eyeballs just, you know, were like, whoa. And, um, and so we popped the tapes in and I, they were like, what would you describe this as? And my thoughts going through my head were the scene from Airplane where um, uh, the reporters are asking that guy, Johnny, one of the ground controllers of like, can you describe this plane? And he's like, oh, it's a big white shiny plane with wheels and, you know, it looks like a big Tylenol. What kind of plane is it? Oh, it's a big, pretty white plane with red stripes and curtains in the window and wheels and it looks like a big Tylenol. And I knew if I described it as a big Tylenol that eh, that's too much not taking it seriously. And anyone who knows me is, I don't take a whole lot of things seriously, but I was like, ah, I probably shouldn't say that. It's just, it's too on the nose. And, and so I was like, well, it looked like a big Tic Tac, you know, and it did like just kind of this white oblong featureless thing. It looks like a Tic Tac. And, and, and it just kind of be, became the, the, the name for it um, for the, the next few days. Little did I know that 17 years ago, it would still be a thing. Um, so it, it's it's rooted in humor, it's rooted in slapstick, and, and it's rooted in my um, interest in that kind of stuff. And, and so that's that's really how the Tic Tac was named. So you thought they wouldn't take the term Tylenol seriously, so you're like, it looked like a Tic Tac. You know? right. yeah. <laughs> I think you chose the best name for a UFO. So what was the form of footage that you took off of the plane? Um, eight millimeter tapes. Um, just, you know, they're about, you know, that big. Um, and we, they, they now use solid state drives. So the footage people are seeing, the famous footage of the Tic Tac UFO, that was off of eight millimeter tapes? Yes. So when you go into the CVC, you've got your radar data and your FLIR footage. Is that all on the same eight millimeter format? Yeah, it's called Civic, uh, oh, Carrier, Civic. Ve Carrier Vehicle Intelligence Center. Um, it, that's where we always go you know i'm still in my flight gear that's that's i don't even take my gear off at the time there were two two sets of tapes that you would put in one was for the right hand display one was for the left hand display um just so you know we could record those simultaneously but you're saying you got radar footage or footage of the radar as well during the tic tac ufo event i did yeah but the the world hasn't seen that yet no, and they're probably not going to see it for a long time um, because the radar tape is are the there's two types of sensors that we record on the aircraft: active sensors and passive sensors. The FLIR is a passive sensor. The radar, however, is an what we call an active sensor. So it's shooting emissions out and re receiving data in and an active sensor can be exploited by our enemies if they can see the data that's on that screen. Okay, so what you're saying is you brought back two types of data. So one is, uh, you know, radar data that is, uh, you know, outward looking, and a lot of that is will remain classified. And the other is a passive system, which is the FLIR, which is just, you know, receiving. And that's the footage that we all know that's been out publicly. Right. Did I get that right? The, you know, you're absolutely correct. Um, and the I, I wish um, we could release the uh, active sensor radar footage to see the initial because. Um, yeah, what would you see on it? Well, th that was the initial contact is, you know, I get a vector from um, the Princeton. You initially do that on your radar. Okay. You don't do that on your flare. Once you acquire your target from your radar, Every other sensor that I have on board my aircraft is all slave to that target. So my FLIR, my um, uh, electronic warfare systems, and it's it's going to um, it's going to lock onto that target and it's going to look at that target and focus on that target. That's that's what it's designed to do. So to be clear, so I understand, you did pick this thing up on radar first. Correct. Yeah. Okay. You saw other sensor data. You saw radar data. Yeah, of course. Once I got the target of interest on my radar, I took a lock and that's when all the kind of the, the funky things started happening. The erratic nature of the Tic Tac, 
the airspeed was very telling to me. And then we started seeing what we call jam strobe lines. Strobe lines are vertical lines that show up on your radar that are indications that you're being jammed. We talked about that when we did a, the audio recording and right. something you said to me that I, that I think is important kind of for people to hear. There was a 2009 investigation where they did a report. It's called the executive summary. I'm sure you've read it, right? Yes. It states in there that you did not receive jamming cues. And that's in contradiction to both your interviews and Commander Fravor's interviews. Could you clarify about that? Were you consulted for that report? Is it just wrong? I was not consulted for that report. I have been interviewed one-tenth of one percent from the government as I have from yourself. I did get jamming cues on my radar tape. And you can see cues of jamming on both your radar and your flare tape. Yeah. You know, when, when like uh, Commander Fravor described on your FLIR tape, when you see like 99.9 uh, range to target, that means that means you're being jammed. It was seen on your SA at, at the time, not just your own radar? Yes. Was there any other traffic at the cap point during the intercept? No, no nothing at all. And we were flying what uh, we call the whiskey areas. Um, they're restricted for military aircraft and we schedule those. Um, more or less for a safety of flights, just to make sure that um, any other military aircraft or civilian aircraft for that matter, are not flying in that um, sector of airspace. There was no red air in the area from the previous exercise. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, right. there, was, there was nothing that wouldn't be identifiable in the sector of airspace that we were flying. And the way that this object was behaving was not indicative of how a civilian or commercial aircraft would fly. Until you see the aggressive maneuver to the left off of my FLIR, anything that it's gonna do is gonna be tracked by the FLIR. And so when the target maneuvered off to the left of my screen, as you see on the uh, FLIR display, that was a result of that object maneuvering itself, not me maneuvering my own aircraft. This completely went off to your left, lost track at that moment the video ends, right? Right. Yeah. It, yeah. As we talked about earlier. Because people are saying it loses track when the bars are widening and, and it's not losing track. It's, it's just, maintaining track. When it widens its bars, it's, it, it's basically telling me that it's, it's losing competence in that track. But then it goes back. You know, you see it, it, it widens out and then it goes back. It never dragged off the target. The FLIR is designed to an engineered to be able to hack that kind of maneuvering, but that the way that that aircraft maneuvered or that object, whatever, is not something that I can explain. It just went whoop, and it was it was off to the races wherever it was going, and and that was it. At the end of the video, we see we mm -hmm. see it appears the object shoots off to to our left. Is that indeed what happened? Oh yes, 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 absolutely. And did you like radio into the Princeton and ask them, where is it? Yeah, absolutely. Because the, the Princeton was our controller to begin with, if this Tic Tac never existed. Um, uh, and so I immediately got on the radar. I'm like, hey, where is this thing? Because uh, I only have a certain scan volume with my radar and my FLIR, and this thing is gone. And so I immediately radioed the Princeton and my E2 Hawkeye controller. I'm like, hey, this target based off of my bearing and range where is it where is it heading and where is it going and they were like negative radar contact which, which means their radars are, are clean you know and and they, they don't see anything yeah but we, that's important that's important because what you're saying is you were you were targeted in towards this tic tac mm -hmm. object using mm -hmm. Other sensors, the Princeton had this a continuous track on it that they send you out. They tell you where to go. You pick it up on your radar. You then slave it over to your optical system. You record all of that. You come back, you put it in. But also when this thing shows these unique displays of movement, the shooting off to your left, you then ask the Princeton, hey, you have a better radar. Tell me, where is it? Where is it going? What's going on? And they're like, it's gone. Yeah. 
th that's <laughs> to put it clearly that, that that's pretty what pretty much what happened and since it shot off to the left you know I immediately vectored my my own aircraft to the left to try to reacquire it and not nothing wow yeah it is just weird so, so tell me like what was weird about what you filmed that day compared to every other day of your flying career that darting off to the left because you know a, as i'm tracking it you know from my radar to my flare i i see that kind of stuff daily however my radar and FLIR should be able to uh, account for that kind of discrepancy. And so once it shot off to the left, immediately aggressively maneuvered my fighter to the left to try to reacquire. And it, it moved with a velocity that I've, I've not seen. I should be able to reacquire that aircraft or whatever it was. Right. And that, that's just, I mean, we're talking a, a an $80 million fighter, you know, it yeah, should, so, so, I mean, this thing shot off at beyond hypersonic speed. If you can't bank the aircraft and then reacquire it, yeah. something it, it shot off. Yeah. And my estimation at this point is that it was about 10 to 15 miles off my nose. I should be able to see an exhaust plume on my FLIR. You should be able to see that heat. I should be able to tell that it's an aircraft. It's, it's got wings. I should be able to tell what type of aircraft it is. I should be able to know that. And I wasn't seeing any of that. If somebody said the Tic Tac that you filmed with a, was a U.S. black project, you told me it's not. Tell me why you know it's not. If there is something out there that you have seen as a pilot or aviator that you weren't supposed to see, you get vectored home, airborne in real time, say, hey, head home. And then you have to debrief with someone who's briefed on that particular project. Which has happened to you. You have encountered something that is a black project and you yeah. had to debrief because, and there's a protocol for that. Exactly. What happens is when you're in the, the intelligence center, um, civic, you describe what you saw. They describe what you've seen. They make you sign a, a non-disclosure agreement or an NDA. And they say, this is the project name. They don't describe what it is or what it, what it does or, you know, anything like that. It's just, you know, you, you shall not speak of this again. That did not happen with the Tic Tac. That mm. did not happen. Nope. So no. nobody said to you, this is, you saw something you shouldn't, this is a black project, you know, sign this NDA. That, that is the protocol. That's what would have happened if it was US technology. Right. U.S. black technology, but that didn't happen? No, and it didn't, didn't happen with uh, Commander Fravor either. What do you think you saw? <laughs> I don't know, Jeremy, man. I have no idea. Like, it was just this, this weird thing that I, I should normally be able to identify or identify with characteristics. Yeah, I had no flight characteristics, you know, uh, a method of lift, propulsion, um, things like that. And it was at a range where I should be able to distinguish flight characteristics. And that just, just didn't happen. What is it like when like your kids, you know, say, Hey daddy, did, did you see an alien, you know, yeah. or do you, you, Hey daddy, did you see an alien ship? You know, do your kids ask you that kind of thing? Oh yeah, they do all the time. And you know, they're, you know, as a fan of uh, star Wars and things like that, um, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy for my kids and things like, you know, whatnot. And and they're just, every day, they're just like, hey, did you see an alien, you know, at work? And I'm just like, no, um, I don't know what I saw. And I told them, uh, I, I can't remember where the quote came from, but uh, there's a quote out there that says, either we're alone in this universe or we aren't. Each is equally terrifying with billions of galaxies and billions of planets that are out there, the odds of us being the only life forms that are here is unlikely. You just kind of have to live with that uh, knowledge and just know that um, we're probably not the only beings out there. You're leaving it on the table that this could be something not from here. This could be, oh, this totally. could have been a vehicle, an extraterrestrial vehicle. We don't know. 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, totally. And, you know, as a rational human being, I, I leave that completely on the table. It, it has, it has to be as a, as a logical, rational person. The evidence that it's our black technologies, um, that seems to be dwindling. That seems to be going away. Yeah, it, that, that seems to be the case. I, I think the Pentagon and the, the folks that put these reports out, I think that that is the correct assessment. The idea this is U.S. technology, we've already talked about how it's not a black project that's, that you would have been treated differently. Does somebody have a technology a thousand plus years ahead of us, another foreign nation that had it back in 2004 when you filmed the Tic Tac? I mean, that would be pretty wild. Absolutely. And I agree with that assessment, both now in 2021 and back in 2004 especially in 2004, like this stuff would not have existed. And um, certainly it wasn't a U.S. unacknowledged black project or even an acknowledged black project. If anyone assumes that it was a, you know, let's just say China, Russia, you know, are are kind of big uh, threats out there that have money and projects, nothing to describe as, that kind of technology that could have acted in that way. Commander Fravor said that he could imagine maybe in 2004, you know, there's stuff he doesn't know, but he says, this is 17 years later. So to keep that technology secret, he said would probably be almost impossible for 17 years. Right. That's why he's saying he's leaning more towards this is not ours. I agree with that. I I agree completely with that. I know we don't have it, that technology. And which means that China and Russia, there's no way. Right. And and that they could just do what Commander Fravor uh, described, you know, the the up, down, left, right, you know, um, the way that it acted on the surface and the way that it acted, you know, getting airborne. That just doesn't, that doesn't happen. And like I said, like that was my weirded out moment was when, you know, he described it and then I saw it. And, and then it was just like, okay, where, where do we go from here? And to be quite honest with you, Jeremy, the conversations at the, the chow hall and things like that, when I'm talking with my fellow aviators, we talked about it a little bit, um, but it just, we just moved on. What changes when you achieve commander, um, what does it do? I, I'm in the reserves. I've been in the reserves for yeah, 10 years. So your daily, your daily job, or your daily life, like, is it um, in a similar field? My civilian job, all that I can tell anyone is I'm a systems engineer. Do, have you ever talked with anybody? Has anybody said, I know you were part of that? Nobody. Every day. People all, talk to you about it? About the Tic Tac? Yeah. All the time. Because oh, I, really? I work with other engineers. And, and so they're kind of wired into this zeitgeist, you know? So they're into it, man. They're really into it. Oh yeah. I mean, because we all work in aviation and things like that. And they're, they're just, they're more interested in it than I am. Um, And so they'll, they'll tell me like, Hey, you know, I saw your article on New York times or whatever. They know it before I do. And, and so they're just like, they're like, Hey man, What's up, UFO man? I'm like, oh god. Oh what? no, <laughs> that's funny. Because, because it seems like since this whole thing happened, it seems like every you know three, four, six months, whatever, something new comes out. I'm like, what new? What is new? Like, I, what 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 are they disclosing that we don't already know? Yeah. Um, well, I'm releasing a lot of shit. Well, I know that. Yeah. And, and that's in your, in your best interest. But, you know, from my perspective, like I wake up on a Monday morning and I'm just like, all right, what now? Like, just, <laughs> that's basically just how it, uh, how it feels, you know, I'll acknowledge it. And they all, they all know the story. And, you know, some of the younger engineers will ask me like, Hey, you're the Tic Tac guy. I'm like, yeah. I mean, I think the biggest point that we got here is that Commander Underwood has a great sense of humor because he <laughs> called the UFO a Tic Tac because he didn't want to call it a Tylenol a because Tylenol. that would just be too absurd. I know. Yeah, you're absolutely right, man. 
thank you for for sharing your story the story about the the tic tac naming with me and with anybody who watches it thank you so much that that's a really cool story i appreciate it you got it brother <laughs>